This is Metal Mike, and in this episode of the 80s Glam Metal Cast, I talk to the guitar wizard from Hurricane, Robert Sarzo. Robert is a super cool guy. We hear what Hurricane is up to today, and we hear the stories behind all their classic albums. Check it out. Robert, welcome to the 80s Glam Metal Cast. How you doing tonight? I'm doing fantastic. Doing real good. How you doing? Oh, man. It's going great. Going great. I really appreciate you talking to me. What's on the agenda for Hurricane this year? Well, Hurricane, the next show that we have is going to be uh, coming up in March 21st, 2020. And that's in Maryland at the uh, Ballroom Blitz. And uh, we're really looking forward to that show. It's a two-day festival. Friday and Saturday, the 20th and the 21st, so we're uh, playing there on the 21st, so we're looking uh, forward to that, and we just played a few weeks ago, so in uh, Denver, Colorado, we were just there, and then uh, we were at NAMM performing, I endorse uh, uh, a few, you know, musical instrument companies, so I always go there at NAMM, uh, for those that don't know what NAMM is, I'll explain it stands for National Association of Music Merchants, and it's the biggest convention in the world of musical instruments. So um, you can imagine, you know, the caliber of people that go there, uh, and, and it's all worldwide, you know. So everybody comes in from the whole world and gets together there in uh, Anaheim at the convention center. Actually, the industry takes over that immediate area there by Disney, mm-hmm. Disneyland. So it's uh, quite interesting. Yeah, I mean, you always see a lot of cool reports coming through uh, online about NAM. So, yeah, I mean, it's got to be a great time. Yeah, I've been doing it since the 80s. Uh, so it's kind of one of those things that I set that time aside. And I, I try to go there at least once or, you know, twice. It's a four-day event. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, nowadays I can only do a, a couple of days because I'm traveling, touring, and, you know, who knows next year if I'll even be able to go. Um, actually, uh, like two weeks before NAM, um, one of my groups got, they wanted us to perform, and I, I had to tell them I couldn't do it because I was already committed to do um, a demonstration, you know, with uh, Seymour Duncan that I endorse that company and also saw to my signature guitar uh, through the company uh, Chromacast Sawtooth and uh, and a few other ones also and that's about it by amplifier that I can that the list goes on and on and on Peterson tuner so anyway once I commit myself you know I there was no turning back I had to uh, go and do the NAM but uh, yeah Hurricane is working on uh, new material um, we, we, we have uh, Jack Cancino on vocals, amazing vocalist, and um, still Tony Cavazzo, still with the band, and so is Mike Hansen. He's been with the band for, gosh, I say over 10 years now. And as you remember, um, Queensryche, when I was playing with Queensryche, Jeff Tate, uh, for those two years, uh, Hurricane also toured opening up with Queensryche, so I was doing both shows. Yeah, that must have been awesome for fans of uh, both bands. I know I'm a fan of both bands, so <laughs> they had to have been killer. It was great, and for me, it was a, you know, it was a blast because I I was on stage for a good three hours and with the same audience. So you know, kind of you know uh, got to warm up with Hurricane, and uh, and then I went on with Queen Strike. So that that was great. That was a lot of a lot of fun. I like doing that. What's the- I love to play guitar. What's the direction of the new music you're working on? Is it sound kind of like classic a Hurricane? Or are you trying something different? What's going on? Well, it's more of a Calypso sound. It's more reggae Calypso. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's pulsy. It's edgy. You know, it's, it's got to have the grind. You know, the, all that the tones. I mean, I love playing that metal tone. You know. Uh, especially I'm playing with one of the best amplifiers in the world. I'd say it's the best tube amplifier in the world, uh, which is the Mesa Barba. It's, it's, it's got that growl, man. It, uh, yeah, it's fucking, uh, yeah, it's, it's just ballsy as hell. So, yeah, I turn it up and I just let it growl. <laughs> and, um, you know, and Tony's still with me, so we still have that 
edge, you know, that we had back then. Uh, so no, it still has that that sound. It's it's melodic. Hurricane was always melodic. Uh, if you listen to the vocal lines, it, it, it wasn't just a bunch of screaming, you know, uh, melodies or no, it kind of has a nice swing to it. Definitely. But you know, hey, you, you still got to be able, to, you know. I like to write with Hurricane that strippers can still, you know, swing around the pole. <laughs> so it's got to have that swing. Gotcha. You know. Well, I think it's pretty crazy, and I'm sure most people know this, but you guys, uh, you and Tony are the brothers of Rudy and Carlos from Quiet Riot. So i got to ask you, did you guys kind of look at your brothers and say, hey, we can do it better than those guys. Let, let's go for it. What, what was your mindset? Uh, it was never like that. I mean, um, <laughs> We were just doing our own thing, you know. We we were into a totally different um, direction, you know. Even though Tony co-wrote "Bang Your Head," did you know that? I did not know that. No, that's a awesome. lot of people don't know that. No, I don't. But I didn't the know that. Biggest one of the biggest hits that you know, Quiet Riot had written was you know, "Metal Health." Tony has musical credit with that. Writing it with his brother when he was in the band Snell. Wow, that's awesome. And Tony was playing with Carlos and with Kevin DeBell before I, I believe before I met him. So he was he came out of that you know that team. Uh, so there was a definite connection. And I met Tony through you know Kevin DeBell introduced us and suggested that we should start a band. But I had just moved from Jersey and I started fresh here because I was already doing studio work with Jimmy I've been in New York. Okay. I I had done a record in nineteen seventy nine and then Arista put put out the record, put us out on tour with Dio Byron and Arista and we toured with uh, supporting Bone Town Rats, Bob Sear. That was our biggest tour that we did. And that was Arenas back in nineteen eighty. Wow. Uh, so when I moved to LA, I already had, you know, worked with great producers, engineers at the record plant in New York, done uh, soundtrack for Stakewood Productions, Robert Stakewood, right after the movie Saturday Night uh, Fever. Um, that the movie was called Times Square. I did, you know, sounds for that movie, and also uh, I played on some of the tracks. Don't can't hurry love. That also. Uh, uh, Billy Joel sang with us on that one, so I, I already had broken into the um, the industry in New York City, you know, doing sessions and tours and all that. So when I came to LA, I already had a plan of what I wanted to do, and uh, that was put something edgy and you know intense, like Hurricane. How'd you guys find um, Kelly Hansen? Like we found Kelly to. A drummer that we had, John Shear, Tony and I uh, were auditioning people. We were writing already. We were uh, rehearsing. We had an office space uh, in Santa Monica, California, and uh, we started looking for drummers and, and other people. But at the same time, I had my four-track TX machine in there, and we started writing, Tony and I, writing and writing and writing. Uh, accumulating material, and the first song that we wrote was Hurricane. Mm. So I, one of the um, journeys of looking for musicians, I, I, I found John Shear from England, great drummer. He had a really great backbeat, and he had heard of a singer named Kelly Hansen, which was doing the club circuit here in California. So uh, John and I and Tony, we went and... Uh, to listen to uh, Kelly sing at one of the clubs he was singing here regularly in L.A. and uh, like, you know, his style. He had, you know, great voice, uh, melodic. He wasn't a, a screamer kind of a guy that just screams, you know. Guy could sing. So um, we brought him in. We, you know, kind of auditioned him, I guess. And he was probably auditioning us, too. <laughs> and we, you know, he knew we, we were doing originals while we were after. You know, we, we had a plan already. So, um, yeah, that, that came about. And then, uh, that, there we go. We had Kelly. That was before we knew Jay Shellen. You guys got uh, you guys got rolling full steam ahead, and you did um, Take What You Want. 
And I mean, that's got some well, killer. We did the, yeah, go right, ahead. Right after that, we, we, we were doing demos and okay. with Killing Shears. And then uh, we were rehearsing at Sound City. And what happened was the, uh, the band Loudness, they were already friends of ours that were rehearsing in the room next door. We had a, a lockout. Hurricane did. And so did they. Uh, you know, they, I guess they were here, you know, trying to break through the industry, you know, like everybody else sure. from Japan. They, you know, obviously everybody knows the Japanese band. Uh, so the drummer lounge is, uh, sits on the drums after our drummer left and we were just jamming and, uh, gosh, he had that sound that we needed, that metal driving sound, you know, that yes. John, John was a different kind of a drummer, more jazzier. He had been playing with the guys from, yes, I believe in England, um, or was well, some of those guys before, yes, it wasn't cool, yes. But anyhow, we really felt that, okay, we had, we weren't signed then. We felt that we had to do the horrible thing, the um, replacement of uh, one of the players, just so at least we could break through the industry, you know, in L.A. and get mm -hmm. signed. So uh, we started auditioning people, and that's when we met Jay, and then we went ahead and we caught the... Um, the CD ourselves, self-produced it. Uh, part of it was also with uh, Kevin Beamish. He helped us, you know, uh, put together the uh, production, but he had to leave uh, to uh, produce uh, another album. But uh, anyhow, that's when we put out Take What You Want. So I, I needed to fill in that space in there, how we came about having Jay. Oh, yeah, no, I'm glad you did. And um, <clears throat> it's funny that you mentioned the drummer of Loudness, and I believe the one that you would have played with, he's he's passed away since, but uh, he, he's an amazing drummer. Yeah. Amazing drummer. Great drummer, great people. Yeah. All of them, yeah. I'll, I'll never forget, you know, I cherish the, uh, the times, all the last that we had. We were teaching each other bad words. <laughs> they were teaching me in Japanese bad words and I would teach him in English and Spanish I gave him a double whammy in Spanish bad words in English <laughs> oh they were fun guys yeah so let's talk about uh, Take What You Want because I mean there's so many killer songs Take Me In Your Arms Hurricane uh, It's Only Heaven uh, I mean just just a killer album coming out of the gate what uh? What are your memories of of doing those songs? Like who? who let's talk about the songwriting. So, for instance, I know a lot of the songs just say written by Hurricane. So, who who were the writers for the, for that album? Oh gosh, that first album is it's hard to think back. Um, again, the, this credits there to everybody equally because I wanted to do something that was very uh, even. Mm -hmm. uh, so no matter who wrote what, but. You know, like the song Hurricane, uh, it was just Tony and I that wrote that. Um, a lot of the guitar riffs, a lot of the ideas were, you know, coming from guitar riffs. And, um, and I do believe, you know, also sitting around and, um, uh, you know, with Kelly, Kelly was also, you know, uh, very instrumental in, in lyrics. And we were all contributing, you know, to what we had to do. But I do remember, you know, a lot of the times, uh, you know, the songs coming, you know, like most bands, you know, from a riff. Right. You start that, or or a hook for a chorus. I myself, when I when I write, I try to think of a solid chorus before a verse, because a chorus is the hook of the song. That's the payoff. Yes. And if you don't have a great hook, you know, for a, or a great chorus, and it's got to sound like a chorus. Don't waste your energy. You can move on or, you know, put it aside. So, uh, I'm always writing every day. I'm, I'm, you know, I've got booklets, you know, with lyrics and, and comments and lines and titles and, um, you know, for, for writing, you have, you know, you got to do that storylines. So that, that's how pretty much it all came about. But that, that, that record was really, uh, really put together by, by Hurricane and friends that helped us finance it. We didn't have a label when we put it together. And we were all, um, we had, you know, odd jobs just to, to keep us going, you know, to pay our bills. So we didn't have the luxury of having, uh, a, you know, a known producer that already had 
a studio and say, okay, guys, here you go, you know, let, let's record this, let's do this, you know, the way that I would like to do it. So when I hear that album, my, and I still listen to it, I hear some of the songs sound a little different than the others, and that's because we did record them in different studios. Okay. And then we, we ended up mixing it ourselves with the engineers. So eventually, um, did Enigma pick you guys up during that time? It was, uh, we put it out through Hurricane. We, we had our own label, but we had distribution, which was Green World Distribution. You'll find some of the uh, a vinyl release. If you see that it says Green World, that was the first pressing or from the same, the first deal. Mm -hmm. So we delivered the record to the record company already financed, which was not really a record company, it was just a distribution company. So I believe that the owners from Green World sold to someone else and then they opened up Enigma Records. I think, ironically, that's how it happened. Mm -hmm. Uh, again, you know, it's 30 something years ago <laughs> and I wasn't totally focused so much on the who owns what. And, you know, my, my thing was more about coming out with great music and, you know, putting on a great band and putting out a great, you know, great show. Definitely. But I believe that's what it was. So the first pressing was Greenwell and then Enigma, uh, later on signed us. So we hand, you know, they we just hand them over the master because we owned the masters on the first release, which was take what you want, and then you know, Enigma took it from there. So basically, building on that, uh, you kind of come into Over the Edge, which I feel is you know the best Hurricane album in my opinion. What do you think about it? I agree, you know, that I worked on. Yeah, I I like that record. I again, um. I think it lost a little bit of the edge. Mm -hmm. um, I would have liked um, a little bit more of an aggressive mix. But I get the direction that Bob Astrum was you know, looking for. <laughs> That's what my dog is. <laughs> I love my dogs. <laughs> they, yeah. I rescue dogs also, by the way. All right, honey. Donna, it's okay, honey. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Japanese chants. I love them. Um, so, yeah, it's a great record. It's, it's got great songs. We did a lot of our pre production with it. We did it the right way. Uh, just uh, being a guitar player, I would like to have more, um, more uh, edge to it. Sure. So, what was it like working with Bob Ezrin? That was great. We had a lot of Cuban coffee. <laughs> we uh, we hung out. Yeah, we became friends. I'm still, you know, I'm still friends with him. I see him, you know, once in a while here and there. And yeah, he, I love the guy. He's great. Were you great a guy to work with? Very creative. Um, you know, I would hang out at his house. Where, you know, the band would go there and co-ride with him. So we just spent a lot of time with him. Good quality time. Went out to see Pink Floyd with him because, you know, he had already produced Pink Floyd. Right. So, um, yeah, I would love to do it again with him, but I don't think he's producing anymore. <laughs> he wants to, uh, you know, the last time I talked to him, he was doing films back in Canada. Mm -hmm. Were you a fan of uh, some of his work in the past, like Pink Floyd and Kiss and Alice Cooper, like some of that? Oh, yeah. Movie? Yeah. Oh, definitely, definitely, yeah. Love his previous work, and, yeah, he's, yeah, he's creative. Yeah. What's your uh, favorite song on Over the Edge, you think? Wow, that, there's a lot of great songs in there, but, you know, one song that I really wanted to get it released as a single was uh, Give Me an Inch. Yeah, yeah, I'm glad you, I, I was going to bring that song up. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's an interesting song. I love that song. I love the twist. We spend numerous of sessions in rehearsal trying different formulas with it and I just love the way it came out. I love the simplicity of the guitar solo that I'm doing mm -hmm. on that song. It's very orchestrated and it just correlates with the vocal melody so well. 
That's a great tune. I really do enjoy that song. You know what's weird? And let me see if you if you pick up on this too. Is when I listen to the vocal melody, something about it reminds me of Duran Duran. I, I, am I crazy or what? Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. I totally agree with you. And at that time that we released it, it would have been huge. It would yeah. have been great because I know instead they released eighteen. I get it. It's because. Right. The story, I get it. Bob produced the original one, you know, and we did the following one, and he played on it too, Bob did. So, but give me an inch. That is so catchy. It is. That's a, the harmonies, the way they came out, the melodies, the, um, the, the way that the, the guitar just drops out. And it's just the oh, you know the driving of the bass and the drums. It's brilliant. Yeah, I agree a hundred percent. I think my favorite, if I had and to I, pick, would be uh, would be "Over the Edge." I like those songs. "Over the Edge" kind of reminds me, not that it sounds like Kiss, but it reminds me of like uh, like like "I Want You," where it's slow in the beginning and then it gets then it kicks you in the head. It gets real heavy. I like songs like that. You yeah, know I mean? yeah, I agree with you. That's another. That, I love that song too. You know, I grew up. Uh, really following people like King Crimson, bands like King Crimson. I don't know if you're familiar with them. My Vision yes. Orchestra, yep. uh, Weather Report, uh, Yes. I've uh, seen Yes back in the day when, you know, everybody was in the band. But, um, oh gosh, all the, uh, yeah, Pink Floyd. I wasn't so much into Pink Floyd. It was a little too slow for me. Yeah. Too moody. Now I get it. I enjoy it more now than I did back in the day, but, um, you know, bands like that, and of course, you know, Jeff Beck and Zeppelin, of course, you know, Beatles, and, you know, my influences of music just vary all over the place through classical and flamenco, and uh, so when I write, it's it's just sometimes it's a little uh, too diverse. (laughs) Right. Uh, I'm on to you. We got to talk about that. I mean, that song, I, I hear it all the time, still on Hair Nation. People people love singing that song. But you guys you guys didn't write that song, though, did you? No, but Bob brought that in at the end. He co-wrote that with, um, I believe his name is Jeff Jones. Yeah, I think, yes. And um, that, that's his name, right? Yeah, I believe you're right. Yeah, and I uh, met him once. Really nice guy. He was really happy. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I like that tune. Um, real straightforward, real simple. You know, uh, again, when we were writing, we, we weren't that simple. We always, because we were all musically more into more intricate patterns mm-hmm. and, you know, playing more in seven eights and five fours and, you know, different time signatures. Uh, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, so we were more progressive, so it was kind of like, well, you know, uh, for us to write something that was just a one, four, five, you know, straightforward, it was really not that rewarding. We wanted more of a writing challenge, but sometimes that's not the, the proper format in the 80s for a radio play or MTV. You know, you kind of kind of fit in a, temp, on a template. Oh, n- definitely. What happened with you exiting the band? Uh, I believe things just got really into different uh, directions. Okay. Um, it's just changes started happening within the group uh, from all different directions, record company, management, demands. Uh, we didn't have any break. We were on the road for almost 300 days out of the year. And traveling, everybody cooped together in the same, you know, space, in small spaces, because we started out first traveling in a van. Um, it, it just, I think it just caught up on everybody. And it's just got really, I don't know, just, it wasn't fun anymore sure. for certain people. And uh, I just, Felt that um, directions, you know, wanted to keep it in the in the core of the band, 
And um, so it just really got, became different for everybody. Mm-hmm. Every, you know, we, we all kind of lost uh, direction of what we were, you, you know, why we started doing what we were doing. It kind of started shifting around, and you know, and people believing everything that we we read in magazines, and you know, you you, you got to stay focused, you got to stay on track, and uh, we never had time to really regroup. It was just uh, wow, it, it just got out of, a little bit out of control with scheduling. Sure. I mean, we were you know fly right back from the road, and all of a sudden you had to lock yourself up in the studio again. You know, uh, you know, everybody needs space. And even if you're married to someone, everybody needs a little bit of space. You know, so that's why, you know, some people have different jobs and work together and, uh, and respect each other's space and, and creativity. So I think that's what happens to a lot of bands. Uh, it wasn't just hurricane, but if you go back and you study and you talk to other musicians, uh, you ask them what happened. And I've heard that so many other from other bands. It's just, uh, it, it was always together, always together. Everybody, no matter how much you love your, your, your guys, you, you with, but people need their own lives also, their own space for, you know, for a moment. No, I totally understand. What do you think of the album Slave to the Thrill? Which album? You know, I really, I think I listened to it once or twice. Sure. I co-wrote uh, 10,000 Years. Yep, yep. And, um, yeah, by then I moved on and I actually, uh, I had my own solo deal through the same record company and I put together what I released years and years later after the storm. Okay. So that's what you were doing? You were doing a solo project at that point when they were yeah. when they moved on? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, do you want I'm to answer? <laughs> do you want to answer that? You don't have to answer it if you don't. Do Do you like? What do you think of that album? Did you like it when you first heard it, or no? Which one? Slave to the Thrill. You know, I felt that it changed the sound. It didn't sound like Hurricane anymore. I agree with you. Yep. And that was it. It was like, oh, now it sounds like a different band. So, okay, you know. Yeah, I agree, hundred um, percent. I think at the time when it first came out, I didn't mind it. But then over time, you know, I, I gravitate toward those first two. And it seems, it's like almost, it's too bluesy. Or, or there's something about it that's that's just too different for me. It just doesn't sound the same. Yeah. But, you know, I haven't heard it in decades, you know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it was, and yeah. Uh, I don't even know, really. If you ask me what it sounds like, like you said, it sounds bluesy. I, I don't know. <laughs> no, I understand. But isn't it crazy when you think about it? And, and my wife and I, we'll talk about this all the time. It's like there'll be a song that maybe you didn't like that much in the 80s when it was out. But for some reason today, you like it. Or, you know, a lot of times it's it's weird how your tastes change over the years. Yeah. And, and that's healthy. That's good. That means we're moving on and we're, you know, we're, we can't just sit still. We have to progress. It's about, to me, success is progressing and, you know, accomplishing yeah. Oh, for sure. Uh, it's 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 more about the journey, not by gaining what you got and then that's it. To me, success is is the motion. Mm-hmm. Does it blow your mind now that Kelly Hansen is the singer of Foreigner? Is that kind of crazy or what? No, no. Um, when I first heard him um, in the club circuit here, I think he was singing Foreigner songs. Was he? Okay, so it wasn't too far off then. No. Uh, no, he's got a great voice, still sings well. Um, not at all, not surprised at all. Yeah, he, uh, he does a great job for the band. Yeah. When was the last time you guys, you guys spoke? On uh, Nam. One of the years, okay. you know, he's got his schedule. I got my schedules, yeah. And, I, you know, the cool thing about Hurricane is everybody's still active and playing because Hurricane kind of, we, we were just very musical. We, we, we really love to do music. We were rehearsed six, seven days a week. We had a lockout. We were in the kind of band that we would go out and party, you know, and hang out, you know, 
uh, on the strip, but we felt that it's a job and you got to produce, you got to got to put out product and to be your best to compete with yourself, you got to give it all you got. And you got to be true to yourself. So, you know, by hanging out in a bar and drinking and telling your friends, you know, how great you're going to be, I ain't going to cut it. No. You got to just do your work and let your friend tell you, oh, man, you did great work. But, you know, don't go around saying how great you are. Just do your work. Let somebody else do it. And then if they tell you, you just take it like, oh, good. I, and that means I should work harder then. <laughs> so I can, you know, continue growing, you know. So, uh, I mean, Jay's been out with Yes. And interesting enough that, uh, you know, we were all into all those bands. So, um, yeah, you know, why not? What was it like playing with uh, Jeff Tate in uh, his version of Queensryche? What was that like? It was great. I, I hadn't met, you know, Jeff back in the 80s. Mm -hmm. And uh, when Hurricane would play Seattle, Queensryche would come and hang out with us. And um, it was great. It's very professional. Uh, I love working with Jeff. And uh, it, it was just great also besides playing guitar but singing with him harmonizing with jeff and to me he's one of my favorite singers of all time in rock and roll so um you know hurricane was a very uh, vocal band we were really into singing and harmonizing and we were warm up our vocals before we would go on stage with harmonies we really worked at it and uh so i had that routine already in my head so with quiz strike with jeff tate we were harmonized before we would go on stage and, and warm up. And um, so really enjoy that. I, I like uh, singing as well. And uh, really enjoy working with my brother in the band. That, that was great, finally, to be doing national touring because we grew up playing together. Right. You know, traveling together, but we were just doing the club circuit back in the 70s. And uh, then to be, you know, actually doing it the way we've been doing it individually, but to do it together with my brother, it was a, it was a thrill. It was a blast. Anything you want to say in closing to all your fans out there? Anything I want to say, I think, you know, love you guys. Uh, I really appreciate your support. And it's going to be more and more of me <laughs> and my bands, you know, playing out there. But, uh, yeah, come down to uh, Maryland. Uh, we'll be there uh, this coming month on the 21st Saturday. Perfect. Okay, Robert, it was a pleasure to speak with you, man. Have a great night. You too, and I want to tell my fans also to please reach out to me on social media. I do read my own Facebook comments. I write back as much as I can to everyone. So... Um, I don't have somebody doing it for me because I want to. I want to feel connected, you know, with everyone, and that's the beauty about social media. We can do that. So even if I'm on the road, I'm always checking up, you know, when I can, uh, to try to, uh, you know, answer anybody's question, and be patient with me because I'm I'm trying to do a lot of stuff here. <laughs> well, that's great that you that you answer everybody <clears throat> because not not everybody does, man. Well. Oh. No, it's a lot of fun. I really enjoy it. All right, brother. You take care. You too. Thank you for the time. Wow, that was a great interview with Robert. He's a real genuine guy who is very passionate about his music. You know what I'm passionate about? This podcast. Help me keep this thing going. Share online and subscribe. We'll talk to you next time.